Now, the next speaker is Anne Pettifor, who is going to be talking about making finance the servant, not the master of the people. Right. Um, uh, help, help. I find it once yes, I could you please? Hi. So I want to begin by addressing um, Michael Northcott's point this morning and, and also trying to get us to think bigger about this problem. Um, we've been thinking about local banks. We've been thinking about a banking system in the UK. We need to grasp that actually the financial system is global and that it's way beyond our control. Um, and we need to understand um, quite how vast and how powerful it is if we're going to actually prepare to think about reform. And uh, I'm, I'm very keen on reform, um, and I'm very keen on the ability of ordinary people to, um, to bring about a great transformation. When we started Jubilee 2000, everybody said to us, nobody's going to care about the sovereign debts of poor countries and about the difference between multilateral, bilateral, and commercial debt. And anyway, nobody understands this stuff. And by the end of four or five years of campaigning, people both had understood it. They would grasped the problem. And we couldn't, you know, we had no control of them. They were really mad as hell. And they went out and showed it. So I know that when people understand a problem, they're able to act on it. And, but what we lack is an understanding. And above all, we lack an understanding of the scale of the problem. There's a brilliant presentation that uh, was given to the INET conference by a professor, Joseph Vogel, which I will recommend to you, who uh, is actually a professor of literature. Really interesting in economics, Michael, that the people who are most coherent about the way the banking, the finance system works, are not economists. Uh, may I recommend Jeffrey Ingham, who is a sociologist, uh, and so is Mary Meller. And, um, and this fellow, uh, Professor Vogel, is a professor of literature. And he said, and I think rightly, that actually what we've experienced over the last five years is a global, if you like, coup d'etat, a capture of the state by the financial system. And here we are fiddling about, you know, in our, in our localities, in our communities, trying to fix what's going wrong, when really there is a, a much bigger force and power out there that's running the show. And why that's important is that they too are creating liquidity. It's not the kind of liquidity that you and I deal with when we, when we undertake transactions, but it enables them to undertake transactions at a global level. And they're things like derivatives and CDOs and all these wonderful products that they've invented. So they are in fact supplanting central banks in the creation of liquidity. So this is a vast, as uh, the fellow from, um, uh, called it, uh, what was his name? You know, great giant vampire squid. And, and, I, I, and I don't want to say this just to be um, alarmist and, and conspiratorial about this, but to give you a sense of the challenge that faces us and the challenge of our democracies. And most of us are asleep at the wheel and don't understand it. So... And as the interesting data from um, Triodos showed about how people don't know what happens to their money. Now, I wanted to start with the level of deception that goes on in the economy. And, and we need to be aware of that, too. And again, I don't want to sound like, you know, the world's a bad old place and everybody tells lies. But, but there is a level of deception and of, of, of obscuring the reality from people, which is dangerous. It's a bit... Michael, to say to you, it's a bit like the debate that must have been going on between the Ptolemaic uh, school and the Copernican school, between the Darwinians and the creationists, you know. The trouble with economics is that the equivalent of the creationists run the show, are all in, you know, they're, in, they're running the show, and that's, that's our problem. But we are at that point where that huge paradigm shift is, and I have to say, my mate Steve Keynes played a really big part in all that. Now this... Uh, we were asked, I was asked by Newsnight to produce my chart of the year for 2011. And I chose this chart. This chart is taken from the budget, the government's budget, 2011. It's the very first chart on the very first paragraph of the very first page of the budget report. And it's a chart of private sector debt in the UK. Now, I've argued for some time, we have argued for some time, that the, the problem facing the UK is not public debt. It's private debt. We have a massive overhang of private debt. 
So I was delighted when I found this chart, you see. But what was interesting about it, I knew they'd taken this from the McKinsey Global Institute's report, which had been produced a, a little earlier. But very interestingly, they don't add in what the McKinsey had done, which is the, the public's debt. They only put in the private debt. So I mentioned that. But I, I quoted the budget report in which said that it starts 1.1 paragraph. There are unsustainable levels of private sector debt rising, and there's rising public sector debt. It's been estimated that the UK became the most indebted country in the world. And that is true, not surprisingly, given the nature of our banking system. And chart 1.1, says the Treasury, highlights the rise in private sector debt in the UK. Households took on this rising mortgage debt and so on. Within the financial sector, it argues, the accumulation of debt was even greater. By 2007, the UK financial system had become the most highly leveraged of any major economy. And finally, it mentions public sector debt as a share of GDP. And so this is the McKinsey, this is the McKinsey chart, which they don't show you. And if you look, the, the, the dark blues are all the private debt, and the pale blue at the top is public debt. Now, that's excluded in the Treasury chart. This is ideological, right? There's a reason that that small amount of public debt was excluded as a share of GDP. And then McKinsey updated their report, and you can see public debt surely has risen from 53 to 81%, or was predicted, yes, 53 to 81. But look, private sector debt has hardly shifted at all. In fact, it had grown over the year. Well, this is Budget Report 2012, paragraph 1.1. The financial crisis of 2008-9 exposed unstable and unbalanced model of growth and ever-increasing levels of public and private sector debt. As a result of that crisis, the unsustainable levels of public spending, the government inherited the largest deficit since the Second World War. And so what we find here is that all mention of private sector debt in the Treasury report has been erased. So this is a kind of, you know, they're trying to fool us, really. The, the government is focused on the public sector debt. It is ignoring private sector debt. That's a very big problem because that debt has to be managed. It has to be written off. It has to be paid down. And if that has to happen in an orderly way or else we have another huge financial crisis. The government's turning a complete blind eye to it and focusing entirely on tackling government debt and, and downsizing government. So we engage here, Michael, to come back to you, in a huge ideological battle. And that explains some of the deceptions and so on. But it, it's, whoops, it's now time for the deception, the delusion and the evasion to end. And it's time for plain speaking, especially for us. It's time for us to understand what's really, really going on because you can't handle stuff if you don't. So the primary cause of the continuing financial crisis is the unprecedented explosion of the vast expanse of deregulated, liberalised private credit created by the, the banks and the financial entities. That is the cause, is the expansion of credit, not the housing bubble. The housing bubble is a consequence, of the, as, as, as Richard has said, of the creation of credit. Credit is like a fuel. It's like pumping oil into the housing market or pumping uh, something more than oil. But it's a fuel that inflated the housing market. It, in fact, inflated all assets. You know, we live in a world in which all economists and all bankers loathe inflation, except when it comes to the inflation of assets which are owned by the rich on the whole. Um, the rest of us live on wages and salaries and so on and so forth. Um, so this is the primary cause of, this, of the crisis. Easy but dear, to use a Keynesian term, credit financed and blew up massive asset bubbles across all the economies. Now, I want to stress the point of dear. You know, this credit was more expensive than it was, for example, in the golden age of 1945-1971. The price, the, the rate, of interest, rate of interest on average rose to very high levels post-71. And I want to argue this point powerfully here because we've got to understand another really important reason for the crisis. Well, first of all, can I quickly say that easy dear mon money fueled 
what I call easy shopping, consumption, which in turn fueled easy debt, emissions. Which is why I think it's really important for Greens to understand the connection between easy credit and the rise in emissions. There is a direct correlation. If we want to deal with emissions, one of the best ways may be to deal with credit and manage credit. And you will then deal somehow with... Uh, 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 this, but that's another story for another time. Who benefited from this? Well, this is a chart taken from Andy Haldane uh, in 2009 about the rates of returns to finance. But, and they were massive. But we all know that story. But the point about this enormous credit is that it burst. And it didn't burst, in my view, in 2008 when Lehman's went bust. Lehman's was, again, a consequence. It burst on the 9th of August 2007. I remember it as clearly as anything. It was the day that banks stopped lending to each other, on the 9th of August 2007. So that's when the credit crunch began. And actually, interestingly, Richard, the first banks to go down were German banks. And although these small banks in Germany are well regulated and so on, there are banks in Germany that were messing around in the global markets. And uh, the first bank uh, to create problems and that had to be bailed out was a German bank. But the point about this credit, the thing that punctured it was very high rates of interest. A credit bubble and an asset bubble doesn't explode and burst as a, uh, by way of spontaneous combustion. It doesn't get this big and then combust. Um, that's not what causes it to combust. What com com causes it to combust is that it becomes unpayable. And what makes it unpayable is the price. And I want to show you this chart which I just picked up last Sunday from Richard Koo. This shows interest rates in the run-up to the crisis, 2003 to 2012. Think of these interest rates, these, these drawings here, as daggers. Think of them as being sharpened up around 2004. And each, with each notch that the, the rate of interest rises, so the dagger gets sharper as it's applied to credit. And eventually, when it reaches its peak in 2007, August 2007, it punctures the credit bubble. And as you can see, uh, in the case of the, uh, the US, uh, oh dear, I haven't given you the color charts of this, sorry. This is, oh yes, he has, here. So the US is the red one. You can see Greenspan reacts quite quickly and starts to try to bring them down. But if you look at the EU, um, the ECB actually puts up interest rates after this, unbelievably. It, it, that, there was a, a similar mistake made in 1923. These are vast, enormous policy errors made by uh, central bankers, and which we, the public, uh, don't take much notice of. But look what happens. They come down to here. Now, what most economists argue is that uh, what caused the crisis was low rates of interest. Now, it is true that when it, what happened is that interest rates did come down. Unfortunately, oh, well, I've got another chart. Let me show you my other beautiful chart. Where is it? Here we are. This is my, this is my favorite chart. This is a chart from um, the Financial Times, which shows interest rates, uh, sorry, the central bank, the Bank of England rate from 1900 through to 2009. Um, it doesn't really quite make my point. I'd better go back again. <laughs> Damn. Um, the point I want to make is that, that interest rates before the dot-com bubble burst in 2000 were high. And the, the, what happened then was because they were high and there was a bubble, the bubble burst, and Greenspan brings interest rates down in 2001, and that, and then they stay low. That's reaction to one of the very many, what do you mean, very many crises, very many crises that have already happened, you know, since the beginning of deregulation. So in reaction to it, he brings them down, and then as a result of the low rates in 2001, people start borrowing even more, and it goes crazy, so he starts ratcheting them up, and then he bursts the bubble. Now, this is really important for us to understand when we come to, um, to the solutions. So the debt is now slowly but chaotically being deleveraged. So you have these terrible stories of foreclosures in the United States. 
you have people defaulting on their debts, you have businesses going bust, you know, it's ugly. It's truly, truly ugly. You have banks going bust and so on. Denial, you know, the orthodox economists, forbearance by the banks, hands off, market clearing, let the market do this, you know, let the market smash everything to bits and we'll, we'll come through somehow, and political sclerosis. So it's slow because uh, firms are very indebted and they're hoarding cash, and they're hoarding cash in my view because they still have debts to pay down. And they are scared as hell because customers are not walking through the door, right? So they're not going to do business and they're hanging on to their cash. And everybody's saying, why don't you spend your money? Why don't you invest? They're very wise to hang on to their cash because austerity is contracting the economy. Things are going to get worse. And austerity is contracting income. Now, income is pretty damn important. If you have a hugely, if you have the most indebted nation on earth, one of the ways you can address it is through the Jubilee Principle, as Steve will talk about. Just write off the stuff, you know. That will be tough for the banks who lent the money. It will be tough for lots of people who, who are owed money. But there will be a quick way of, you know, getting rid of it. There's another way. You can pay it down. But you cannot pay down debts without income. And what the government is doing now is contracting income. It's contracting the, the economy. So, for example, all those public sector workers... Who've, got, uh, who've lost their jobs, have got mortgages. And they're not going to be able to pay their debts. That's going to hurt the banks. That's going to make the thing worse. Right? So austerity is contracting income, and the government is saying, nothing to do with me, Gov. So there is a very big problem. Now we have, this is ridiculous, I have three minutes in which to explain this, but we have the economic tools, and they are known and understood to solve this problem, these problems of this crisis, because we've been through this crisis before, we, we had a massive credit bubble in the 1920s, it burst in 29, and we had recovery by 1933. When Roosevelt came to power and took charge, things began to get better in the United States, jobs were created, debt was written down, banks were stabilised, and they began to grow. It took Britain a bit longer, we had a Labour government, the Labour government didn't want to play Keynesian economics, they preferred austerity. So they preferred to split the Labour Party, destroy their government and go into a coalition. Finally, a Conservative government comes to power, Chamberlain, and begins to learn the lessons. So these, these tools are known and understood. They were used in 33, and they were used um, by the Conservative, and they were used again in 45 to 71, when we had this period of extraordinary stability. And I want here to show you, this is the famous chart from Rogoff and Reinhardt. And this shows you capital mobility around the world and the incidence of banking crisis from, uh, I think it's 1800 through to 2000. And you'll see there's massive volatility, especially with the growth of globalization around 18, the 1870s, 1890s. And uh, great volatility, big crises, 1914, huge crisis of war and so on. And then 1929. Then you see 1933 and 1940, and you have this period where there are no crises. And that's the period in which capital was constrained, and capital controls those, were, that's a Keynesian period. That's capital. Now, you know, when you talk to economists about this, they say, well, you can't possibly go back, the genie is out of the bottle, etc. That's rubbish. I want to show you this chart. This chart shows you interest rates, the, the bank rate um, over this period. And what's so striking about it is that you see that it's quite volatile, 2, 4, 8% and so on, which is very, very high if you, own, uh, you owe a million dollars in debt, right? And then we get to, I wish I had a pointer, we get to 1933, when Keynes's influence on A, the Bank of England, and B, the Treasury, brings down interest rates. And you'll see they stay at a very low rate, which was unprecedented until this crisis. From 1930 until 1950, there's a glitch in the middle when apparently Keynes went to America or something, and the, <laughs> and the bank officials got a call. But this is a time when Britain borrowed more than it borrowed in history before to fight a war. So Keynes had introduced a system for managing capital and interest rates to keep money cheap and affordable while we were beginning to prepare ourselves for war. We're now facing another challenge equivalent to war, which is climate change. 
We need the resources, we need the new investments, we need, we need to do all the things we need to do to, to meet that challenge. It's a bit like a war, and we need the kind of economic tools that will make that happen. We know how to do it. We need uh, capital controls. So he gave us the tools with which to stabilise a chaotic, out-of-control financial system. So the, the first is the creation of finance or money by the Bank of England out of thin air and aimed at sound government investment, not speculation. So the whole thing you're doing when you're... When you, uh, uh, have I got the other chart by Richard Q, which shows that most of the QE, and by the way, everyone, would think, everyone thinks Richard invented QE. We've been doing QE since 1694. It was called different things. It was called money market operations but it doesn't date from the Japanese crisis. Okay. The Bank of England has been creating credit, thanks to a genius, by the way, a Scottish genius called John Law, since 1694. And I won't talk about John Law at this point. <laughs> but uh, the fact is that the, the Bank of England can create finance and can aim that at the government, in whatever way it gets to the government, for sound government investment and not speculation. The point is to curb speculation. Now, the really important thing is you can create all this money, and I personally think that credit creation is a wonderful civilizational advance, right? If you live in a society where there is no banking system and there is no credit, where you cannot actually manage, you cannot embark on new initiatives because there is no credit system, and there are societies like that across Africa, it's pretty damn awful, okay? So I think it's a great invention. It's a great civilizational advance. But we have to, um, we have to manage it. And, but the thing about it is that while this creation of money is a wonderful thing, it's actually pretty pointless. What's really important is how it's spent. And what we fo tend not to focus on is the spending of the money. At the moment, it's spent in speculation by bankers. They're taking the liquidity created by the Bank of England, the $16 trillion created by the, three cent the big central banks over this crisis, and they are gambling on the possibility of making a bit more cash to clean up their balance sheets. Very little of it is going into the real economy, as people have already shown today. So the next thing we have to do, as Richard has said, is regulate credit creation by the bank. But most important for me, absolutely fundamental, and I say this as someone who cares about the ecology, the ecosystem, is we have to have permanently low rates of interest for moral as well as for ecological reasons. The, the, the Earth and the Earth's assets have limited rates of return. We cannot go on extracting assets from the Earth at exponential rates. But if you have to pay back rates of interest on the scale that we've had over this last two decades, we are going to have to tear up the forests of Brazil, we're going to have to empty the seas of fish, we're going to have to just go on and on scouring the Earth. For, for resources to repay our debts. And Keynes was above all about low rates, permanent low rates of interest. His general theory was, after all, about employment, interest, and money. And people forget the interest element. And then capital control. Now, I have no time, but I have to say, and I've put it there very boldly, capital control can take all kinds of forms. I don't believe we're going to impose capital controls. I don't think if people don't understand where their savings are going, they sure don't understand capital controls. They're not going to go and fight and vote for people on the basis of whether or not they're going to impose capital controls. So it's going to be a tough thing. So we are going to have a cataclysm. We're going to have a cataclysm. There is another financial crisis brewing. It is going to be catastrophic. It's probably going to be in Europe. The, the European policymakers do not know what they are doing, and they're allowing this thing to just spiral out of control. And then we will have capital controls. Okay. <laughs> and I can tell you the first countries to impose them will be the United States and Britain. So when people tell you, oh, it's terribly difficult, you know, the genie's out of the bottle, you know, we can't go back and so on, that's what they said in 29. That's what they said in 1918. And sure enough, you know, the genie could, uh, in 1914, and sure enough, the, the genie could be put back into the bottle. So there are six quick steps. Capital controls, you know, no big deal. Large-scale reform of the banking system. Large-scale reform of the debt management policy of the government. Government expenditure, investment in the Green New Deal. And the reason for that is, as Keynes said, there's absolutely no point in the government doing what you and I can do and what everybody else is doing 
the government has to do what nobody else is doing. And right now, nobody has the money, has the confidence, has the risk appetite to invest in you know, transforming the economy away from fossil fuels. So the government has to do it. And then we've got to create fossil fuel substituting jobs in public and private sectors. And the reason we have to do that is because, A, our society is going to disintegrate if we don't keep people employed. And for all those Greens who think unemployment is a, group, a, green, a good thing, I just want to tell them I've just come back from Berlin post-war. Okay. And when people are unemployed and in despair, and when you think of the Weimar Republic, an awful lot of damage gets done to the environment. So we cannot afford socially or ec ecologically to have unemployment. But the reason that it's so important and is this that it generates income. And income will give us wages and salaries. And just as wages and salaries make things affordable for me and you, so they will make things affordable for government. Profits for SMEs and so on. And the result? Recovery. So, you know, that's five, five tools and six steps. Not difficult, really. It takes political will. But it starts here with great conferences like this, where we begin to think and argue about this. And let's turn this into... Jubilee 2000. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.